In the years before he became a beloved singer-songwriter and focus of one of the most fervid cults of fans in the classic canon, Leonard Cohen was a veteran published poet and novelist with four volumes of poetry and two novels to his credit. I'm no expert on poetry, I'm barely even literate in it, and it's a well-broadcast fact that I hardly ever listen to the lyrics of songs, but I was struck by the huge differences in tone and directness between Cohen's poems and his song lyrics, his poems being much less florid and much blunter and more forceful than his song lyrics, while covering much the same territory, themes of power, lustful obsession, misspent energies, cruelty, and a kind of resentful devotion. Cohen's poems are very direct. They don't linger on their themes or try to emboss their language with flowery motifs. With each volume, he pairs his language back while always echoing his primary influences, Pablo Neruda, T.S. Eliot, Yeats, and the Canadian poet Irving Leighton. Cohen had numerous poems published when a student at Montreal's McGill University beginning in 1951. His first commercial volume, Let Us Compare Mythologies, arrived in 1956. I heard of a man who says words so beautifully so that if he only speaks their name, women give themselves to him. If I am dumb beside your body and silence blossoms like tumours on our lips, it is because I heard a man climb the stairs and clear his throat outside our door. Let Us Compare Mythology sold 400 or so copies to generally good reviews. Sustained by a $2,000 literary grant from the Canada Art Council, Spice Box of Earth followed in 1961. This book sold relatively well and earned Cohen serious accolades from the literati and established his reputation as a writer. The weary psalmist paused his instrument beside. Departed was the Sabbath and the Sabbath bride. The table was decayed, the candles black and cold, the bread he sang so beautifully, that bread was mould. He turned towards his lute, trembling in the night. He thought he knew no music to make the morning right. Abandoned was the law, abandoned was the king. Unaware he took his instrument, his habit was to sing. He sang and nothing changed, though many heard his song. But soon his face was beautiful, and soon his limbs were strong. In 1960, he submitted for publication The Favourite Game, an autobiographical Bildungsroman, which was rejected and revised to barely half its original length, a process Cohen resented deeply. The Favourite Game was finally published in its eviscerated form in 1963 to poor to middling reviews. I found it was largely tedious, particularly the more it went along, but there were some inspired moments early on, particularly the vignette where the protagonist seeks to learn hypnotism. Cohen, by now living off a modest stipend from an inheritance on the treeless island of Hydra in the Aegean Sea, was in the middle of a tumultuous, passionate and confused relationship with Marianne Island. He was also wildly addicted to amphetamines, which he used to help him to write. He was psychologically unstable and frequently collapsed from dehydration. His next volume, 1964's Flowers for Hitler, was devoted to Ireland. Now let him go sleep with history, the real skeleton stinking of gasoline, his mutton Jeff henchman beside him. Let them sleep amongst our precious poppies, cadres of SS waken in our mind, where they began before we ransomed them to the actual empty realm, we people with the shadows that disturb our inward peace. For a while we resist the silver black cars rolling slowly in parade through the brain. We stuff the microphones with old chaotic flowers from a bed that rapidly exhausts itself. Never mind, they turn up as poppies beside the tombs and libraries of the real world. The leader's vast design, the tilt of his chin, seems excessively familiar to minds at peace. Although their relationship ended in 1972, Cohen and Ireland remained close for the rest of their lives. So much so that when Ireland entered the terminal phase of her leukemia in 2016, he penned her this final message.
Dearest Marianne, I'm just a little behind you, close enough to take your hand. This old body has given up, just as yours has too. I've never forgotten your love and beauty, but you know that. I don't have to say it anymore. Safe travels, old friend. See you down the road. Endless love and gratitude. Leonard. Island died in July 2016. Cohen was to survive her by four months. In 1966, Cohen published his masterwork, Beautiful Losers, to woeful sales and tepid reviews. In Beautiful Losers, where all bets are off, as Cohen reinvents his own language and his imagination in using it, with a complex, in places unfathomable, three-way time travel and tour de force, in which it's uncertain that two of the three characters even exist, or whether or not one character and another are in fact interchangeable. Some of the themes and language of Beautiful Losers will re-emerge later in Cohen's career as he begins to obsess with less fleshly matters and his own mortality begins to appear on the horizon. Steam coming off the planet, clouds of fleecy steam as boy and girl populations clash in religious riots, hot and whistling like a graveyard sodomist, our little planet embraces its fragile yo-yo destiny, tuned to the secular mind like a dying engine. But some do not hear it this way. Some successful moonshot eyes do not see it this way. We do not hear the individual noises. Shh, hiss. They sound like the sound of sounds together. They behold the interstices flashing up and down the cone of the flowering whirlwind. Out of money and in a troubled place with his relationship with Mary Ann, Cohen headed for Nashville in hopes of getting a recording contract. A chance meeting with Judy Collins saw her take two of his songs, Suzanne and Hey That's No Way To Say Goodbye, which ultimately saw him signed to Columbia. While songwriting opened up new possibilities for Cohen's work, especially in allowing the influence of Garcia Lorca's doomed romanticism greater reign, especially in the earlier albums, before being replaced by an increasingly weary and bitter 1970s tone, culminating in the album Death of a Ladies Man and the volume Death of a Ladies Man, but his reputation was largely made by his early songs, which were cut to the broader canvas afforded to him by songwriting. Now the flames, they followed Joan of Arc as she came riding through the dark. No moon to keep her armour bright, no man to get her through this very smoky night. She said, I'm tired of the war. I want the kind of work I had before, a wedding dress or something white to wear upon my swollen appetite. Well, I'm glad I heard you talk this way. You know, I've watched you riding every day. Something in me yearns to win such a cold and lonesome heroine. Who are you? She sternly spoke to the one beneath the spoke. Why, I'm fire, he replied, and I love your solitude. I love your pride. Then fire, make your body cold. I'm going to give you mine to hold. Saying this, she climbed inside to be his one, to be his only bride. And deep into his fiery heart, he took the dust of Joan of Arc. And high above the wedding guests, he hung the ashes of her wedding dress. It was deep into his fiery heart, he took the dust of Joan of Arc. And then she clearly understood, if he was fire, oh then, she must be wood. I saw her wince, I saw her cry, I saw the glory in her eye. Myself, I long for love and light. Must it come so cruel, no so bright. 1972's The Energy of Slaves retained the edgy, menacing tone of Flowers for Hitler. Filled with rage, self-loathing, and a literally burning desire. I could not wait for you to find me dead in a rented room. My sunglasses dusty on the card table, so once again I tried to set my throat on fire. This time in silence, and not thinking of you at all because I had so much time to kill. The volume gives a constant and consistent insight into the depths of Cohen's clinical depression, which reached its deepest ebb in 1978. 
The energy of slaves is a rambling volume, irregularly titled poems, often difficult to tell where one begins and ends, but as accumulated history, it cuts a dark and not always virtuous portrait of the artist. The silly girl, the silly girl, oh, the silly goose, look at her goose flesh. She stood up as soon as the water was very shallow. She stood up, leaving the crouch from which she waded. Write with compassion about deceit in the human heart, in my heart, about my appetite for revenge, how I hate you when others love you more than you love me, how I hope your art will fail when others love you more than I love you, when others love you more than they love me, my unceasing struggle for fame and money, my lies, my lies, I tell you, in order to trick and eventually humiliate you, because this is one of my intentions. From whose point of view are you trying to love your body, composing special expressions for yourself when you consult the mirror, concealing your double chin even from yourself? You can no longer control the ones you love. Are you happy now that no one wants to undress you, wants to kiss you and caress you and handle you. You have no idea what to call it. And this is what you wanted, to live in a house that is haunted by you and me. 1978 saw the arrival of the ineffectual and confusing death of a ladies man, full of almost scrap-like poems and often sarcastic commentaries on them, which occasionally invert the interpretation the reader may have arrived at. At the time, Cohen was drinking constantly, drugging regularly, and loving indiscriminately, all the while recording, along with celebrated loon Phil Spector, the Death of a Ladies Man album. Note the deliberate difference between ladies, L-A-D-I-E-S in the album title, and L-A-D-Y apostrophe S in the volume's title, an album which he often stated was a failed experiment. Much as I agree, I will offer that True Love Leaves No Traces from it is one of his finest songs. True Love Leaves No Traces is derived directly from a poem called As the Mist Leaves No Scar on Spicebox of Earth. I decided to jump literature ahead a few years. Because you're angry, I decided to infuriate you. I am infected with the delirious poison of contempt when I rub my huge nose into your lives and into your works. I learn contempt from you. Philistine implies a vigor which you do not have. This paragraph cannot be seized by an iron fist. It is understood immediately. It recoils from your love. It has enjoyed your company. My work is alive. Cohen effectively disappeared in the late 1970s and early 80s, spending increasing amounts of time at the Mount Baldy Monastery. The experience began to increasingly colour his poetry from this point on. In 1984, Columbia rejected his Various Positions album, releasing it only in Canada. Luckily for him, an independent label picked it up and released it in the USA, Australia and Europe, where it sold quite well. Columbia didn't pick it up until 1990. The album had been preceded by Book of Mercy a volume of 50 pieces of prose in the form of modern psalms, which to be brutally honest to contemporary ears, sound like so much new age plot that came to dominate the 80s and 90s with its droning prosody and mystical of and thou explorations. You who pour mercy into hell, the sole authority in the highest and the lowest worlds, let your anger disperse the mist in this aimless place where even my sins fall short of the mark. Let me be with you again, absolute companion. Let me study your ways, which are just beyond the hope of evil. Seize my heart out of its fantasy. Direct my heart from the fiction of secrecy. You who know the secrets of every heart, whose mercy is to be the secret of longing. Let every heart declare its secret. Let every song disclose your love that has bring to you the sorrows of our freedom. Blessed are you who opens a gate in every moment to enter in truth or tarry in hell. Let me be with you again. Let me put this away, you who wait beside me. Kindle the darkness of my calling. Let me cry to the one who judges my heart in justice and mercy. Arouse my heart again with the limitless breath you breathe into me. Arouse the secret. 2006 saw the last volume published during Cohen's lifetime, Book of Longing 
which just opposes the cosmic and the carnal, acting as almost a journal of his days on Mount Baldy and his desires both spiritual and depraved, his lust for God and for the touch of woman. The poems are simple, often witty, but lack the magnetism of his best pre-1977 work. The elements don't seem to gel especially well. The sense of fiery wonderment that we found in Spice Box of Earth, for example, is gone from the poems, replaced by a weary observation of a self that, for all his mystical ramblings, he doesn't truly seem to recognise. Then a lot of things happened. I was struck on the head by an atheist. I never recovered my sense of confidence. Even today, I'm frightened by the smallest things. Old Mother Hubbard moved into the wound and produced her brood. For many years, my head was laced up. I pretended to help everyone. I sobered up. I faced my misery. Pine trees appeared, gray mountains, misty vistas in the early morning, people with interesting lives. God, your life is interesting, I never stopped saying. I never stopped shaking my head in convivial disbelief. There's so much I want to tell you. I'm the luckiest man in the world. I learned to skin a rabbit with very few incisions and a lot of elbow grease. Easter is my big season. The whole thing comes off in one swoop and you stuff it with Kleenex and sell it. Saturday night really is, as they say, the loneliest night of the week. I hunker down with my radio and a few balls of twine in case I want to tie something up. I let the cabin get very cold and I rejoice in my good fortune. Sometimes a spider will descend on a hideous wet thread and threaten my hard-earned disinterest. My advice is highly valued. For instance, don't piss on a large pine cone. It may not be a pine cone. If you're not clear about which spiders are poisonous, kill them all. The daddy longlegs is not a spider. It actually belongs to the Serratino crime family. Although insects value their lives, and even though their relentless industry is an example for all of us, they rarely have a thought about death. And when they do, it's not accompanied by powerful emotions. As it is with you and me, they hardly discriminate between life and death. In this sense, they're like mystics. And like mystics, many are poisonous. It is difficult to make love to an insect, especially if you're well endowed. As for my own experience, not one single insect has ever complained. If you're not sure which mystics are poisonous, it's best to kill one you come across with a blow to the head, using a hammer or a shoe or a large old vegetable, such as a petrified giant daikon radish. Cohen got a nasty shock after leaving Mount Baldy. His girlfriend slash manager had cleared out his bank accounts, making off with almost $5 million. Cohen spent his last productive years trying to make up that money, touring from 2008 to 2013, issuing a stream of enjoyable but slightly samey albums, beginning with the exceptional I'm Your Man and culminating in You Want It Darker, issued three weeks before his death. His final volume of poetry, The Flame, Leonard Cohen died on the 7th of November 2016 after complications from a fall. He was 82 years old.